So you have half an hour. The floor is yours. Oh, put the slides up, yeah. Do we have my right show? Am I talking into here or into there? Okay. Okay. Hi. Thank you. Thanks, Olga, for a kind introduction. Thank you, Jan Peterson, for putting together such a uh, ambitious and, and awesome uh, seminar here, which I hope I can get things started in a good way with. Um, and I totally forgot that that was the, th the thesis I was going to talk to. I have a slideshow. There's 67 slides on here. And um, I'm going to try to talk a little bit about printed matter, our history, and our mission, and some of the things that we do. I'm going to hopefully fold a little bit of history of artist books. I'm going to try to touch on this dissemination of knowledge theme. I'll try and hit a couple of the points in what the title of my speech is that I'd forgotten about. Um, I've, uh, whatever, I'll get back to it. It'll come. It'll come. And then also we'll try to run through at least some of the 67 slides going on here. Um, has, how many people here have been to Printed Matter? Just out of curiosity, has anyone been to Printed Matter? So a fair number of you, yeah, right on. We actually, at the New York Art Book, Fa Book Fair last year, we know P Torpedo well. They've been coming to the fair for quite some time. And last year, with the support of the Norwegian consulate, um, we actually had a Norwegian focus, where we had a whole room with about 20, some 20 or more Norwegian publishers featured at the, at the New York Art Book Fair, which is really great. So that's Printed Matter, Inc. That's our logo. Um, that's our current storefront on 10th Avenue in the Chelsea area of New York. It's a window installation talking about the dissemination of knowledge by the artists uh, 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 David Court and Joshua Thorpe. And they interviewed um, a bunch of different kind of people, artists, architects, and um, other thinkers, um, cultural workers, about the area, about the exterior of printed matter, the social and architectural space around the store, as well as the interior of the store, the books and the design of the interior of the store and they fragmented the different material from the different uh, interviews, including among them the architect uh, Mark Kreienhoff, who designed the space, and the artist uh, slash architect Dan Graham. And uh, they interspersed the different texts together, and the ones talking about the inside of the space were on the outside facing in when you look into the store. The ones talking about the outside space were on the inside of the store looking out. And that window installation is done kind of in the tradition of uh, the window installation series that Lucy Lepard did at, at, uh, at Printed Matters uh, Old Space on Lisbon Art Street in the 1970s. And this is uh, one of the earliest public uh, exhibitions of Jenny Holzer's Truisms that was part of the, the, the window installation series that um, Lucy Lepard organized in the space where she wanted to deal with works that directly confronted the, the public audience, not an art audience, but rather more the working class and people working, walking to and fro uh, in the space outside of printed matter. So that's my little prelude. And now I'm going to skip forward. Now we're going to talk about books. OK. So um, printed matter was founded in 1976 by uh, a group of people working in the arts, including Lucy Lepard and Saul Lewitt. Um, um, and basically, it was founded in response to this growing phenomenon of all these artists making their work in book form uh, in large offset editions. And it was set up in order to help support and distribute these artist books that were meant to be cheap and affordable and widely circulated. Um, I guess the first question is, what is an artist book? And I know this room is filled with academics and students and, and, and everything like that, but I've been working at Printed Matter for 25 years, and I encounter people in the art world who still have a very kind of fuzzy, uh, uh, don't really distinguish between conventional art books like monographs, catalogs, exhibition catalogs, and other things, 
of that sort and artist books. And I think one of the easiest kind of introductions or way to uh, grasp an artist book is what it is not. It is not a conventional art book. It isn't a book about art, but the artist book is the art. Having said that, an artist book can be just about anything because obviously contemporary art can be just about take any form or be anything you would like it to be. So at Printed Matter, we try to have a very open, fluid, malleable, shifting idea of what artist books can be, indeed. Um, what drew artists to the book form as a site and as a form and as a process to make their work, there's certain kind of formal qualities of the book that were, people got very excited about. Obviously, there's a very ancient tradition of book in the arts going back to the beginning of the book and the beginning of art from papyrus and, and pictographic writing and other kinds of things um, through you know, medieval illuminated manuscripts and, uh, and uh, livre d'artiste deluxe editions done uh, in the late 19th century. But kind of in the, uh, in the post-war period, beginning in the 60s and 70s, and I should paraphrase that because actually there's really interesting antecedents and antecedents to uh, contemporary artist books in the kind of modernist age with Dada, surrealist, um, and futurist you know, books that are really extraordinary um, uh, full uses of the book as the artwork that really qualify, I think, also as contemporary artist books. But it's in the 19, and then really in the 1950s and really in the 60s and 70s that we see this real explosion of artist books being done in, um, in large editions. And what drew artists to the book was certain formal qualities, of course, um, because it's this space that it has an architecture, it has a structure, it has moving parts, it has a mechanics, it has multiple surfaces, so really it's multiple dimensional, unlike you know, a two-dimensional work of art that sits flat on the, on the, on the, on the wall. It, you actually, it's interactive, you have to engage with it, you turn the pages to experience the entirety of the work. Um, and having said that, it also, there also are kind of social and political qualities of the book that also really drew the artist to it. I guess foremost is that it's a public form of art. If you make an edition of a thousand copies, you can have a thousand people, a thousand, an audience of a thousand people. But unlike a you know, conventional sculpture in the town square or in pop culture where everyone's looking at the artist kind of in the panopticonal um, you know, arena and stuff like that where everyone's experiencing the, experiencing the work within the same kind of architectural and ideological space is with the artist book, you don't read it collectively, you read it one-on-one. -on -one. So um, it's both public and then it's also personal. Um, also, it was the kind of ubiquity and the ordinariness of the book that really drew artists to it, is that it really, one encounters it and interacts with it and experiences it within the context of their everyday life, which of course is a great, you know, avant-gardian, you know, uh, 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 desire to take off, you know, work out of the museum, out of the Hallowed Museum, out of the academy maybe even, and, and, and fold it into your everyday life experience. Um, and then also the book offers an alternative space. On the one hand, many of the, say, conceptual artists who are working often in book form in the 60s and 70s, um, it was an alternative space because they didn't have commercial gallery representations. They weren't being shown in the museums. And frankly, their work being about ideas and taking the form of, you know, whether it's uh, photographs or, or texts or diagrams or other types of documentation works just as well, if not better, in book form. And since much of the work was also an implicit critique of kind of commodity fetishism and the kind of capitalist nature of, of, of culture, um, what better form than for it to be in a, in a, in a, in a, in a large, large edition published book that you can buy for, uh, for, for, for very inexpensively. Um, um, the book also proposes an alternative economy where um, instead of this instead of an economy based on either you know the 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 aura of uniqueness or the um, or scarcity as in limited edition prints and stuff like that is uh, it's based on basically the cost of raw materials an industrial process of manufacturing the printing the the offset printing process. Um, and the cost of the book correlates immediately to those exact, uh, the, the price of the book correlates immediately to those real economic costs. And you don't have this kind of excessive value being placed on it as people get famous and genius, genius and, and, and authenticity and these different things get um, ascribed to them. Um, 
So there are many different aspects of the book that drew artists to them. And um, I probably took up way too much time. How do I advance this by doing this? Yeah, so this is Saul, a classic book by Saul Lewitt called Four Basic Kinds of Line and Color, and it is exactly what it says it is. With, uh, uh, in the first thing he shows all the different, taking basic formal elements, uh, showing um, you know, vertical, uh, uh, horizontal, uh, di two di direct direction diagonal lines, and then putting them into all their combinations. And then the, the interior, the rest of the book, is a sampling of all these different, all these different uh, possibilities. A book by Lawrence Wiener, um, one of his early works, Green as well as Blue as well as Red, his austere kind of uh, 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 conceptual texts showing different possible aesthetic possibilities. Um, and then later his work becomes much more kind of poetic and playful with graphics included, uh, The Blue Moon Over, which is also a, um, a, uh, a, a, a kind of conceptual comic and also a digital movie as well. Um, there's also, of course, a literary tradition to artists' books based in experimental poetry where the kind of visual writers and concrete poets eventually started making more and more elaborate constructions which took into account both the typographic as well as aesthetic as well as symbol symbolic uh, uh, aspects of, of language. Um, and this is one that deploys uh, uh, images along with, um, by Peter Zelovansky along with uh, with other, uh, with other, with other uh, printing methods, including rubber stamps um, and photocopying, and then ultimately offset printed. Um, maybe I'll segue here into a little bit about what printed matter does. Printed matter is probably the leading resource for artist books in the in the world. We have a we have an open submission policy where anyone is welcome to submit unsolicited um, books that have already been published. Um, we get about 100 submissions a, a month, and we accept probably about 35 to 40 percent of them. We pride ourselves on being inclusive as possible, while um, many leading artists, such as Jenny Holzer, who's, who did that early window installation, and, and others, you know, Printed Matter was one of their first venues of, of, of showing their work, you know, artist books, window installations, and other things. Um, and many of them continue to stock us, you know, to supply us with books or we carry their books. But we really pride ourselves on the fact that um, student artists or an unknown anarchist collective or, or, or an artist from every corner of the world you can imagine uh, books, you know, share the same shelf space and in our view importance as Jenny Holzer or Richard Prince or people like that. Um, um, we are... We, are, we, we represent about 12,000 titles by over 5,000 artists from pretty much across the globe. Um, but we're also much more than a bookstore, is that we have a full schedule of public programming. We have exhibitions throughout the year that focus on different aspects of artist books, on historical periods or artists, specific artists or groups who had a very active publishing or bookmaking practice. Um, we do events up to three a week. Um, including book launches, but also panel discussions, artist talks, readings, screenings, performances. We even had a, a black metal band play once for you uh, fans out there. Um, and, uh, and we also have a publishing program where we put out about four to eight books a year. Um, and uh, the publishing program is not by open submission, it's, it's, it's by invitation, and we first have to raise the money, and then we have to identify artists either who have a strong kind of uh, 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 record of, of, of bo book works, or also people who we think's work would really lend itself well into an artist book. Um, and we also have, uh, uh, we also work closely with leading library collections and helping them develop um, their collection, their collections and other institutional collections, uh, including the Museum of Modern Art Library, which has the biggest artist book collection in the world. Um, and we also have uh, growing pub, uh, 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 institutional partnerships. We have. We have kind of printed matter, small, modest outposts in in um, in uh, the Midwest, uh, in the in the on the West Coast. Uh, one is opening just in uh, in Mexico City soon, and then also in Sydney, Australia. And then we also organize and and uh, we we founded and organized the New York and LA Art Book Fairs, which have become pretty much the leading forum for the commerce, but also for the. Um, for the, for the investigation and also finally the celebration of, of artist books and art books, artist books, and other forms of creative publishing. 
And at the last New York Art Book Fair, we had, a, we had over 350 um, exhibitors from around 30 countries and an attendance of 35,000 people. And in LA, we also do a fair in LA in its fourth year. We had also an attendance of 35,000 people. So it's really grown into a, into a kind of rock concert <laughs> scale um, production. And it feels like it because there's a lot of like rock, there's a lot of uh, interesting uh, artist bands playing as well at the same time. Um, we are a nonprofit organization. So it's through our history has really been a, a struggle for financial survival. Um, our, we were founded in 1976, as I said, so it's been a 40-year struggle, a financial, financial struggle for survival. Um, uh, we get funding from a wide variety of sources. We have to be incredibly creative and resourceful in trying to figure out how to pay for all of this activity. The books that we carry, we carry them based on their, what we feel is their merit, on, their, on what they add to the field. So many of the books we carry sell at at rates of say once one or two a year, some even sell at a rate of two or th once every two or three years, meaning if it's an edition of a thousand, it'll still be in print in like 955 years. And then after that, then everyone will get to have their accessible artist books. So, but anyway, we, we keep these books in stock for the most part because we feel they add something important to the field and our, our, um, our, our uh, mission is to represent the field in its fullest. Um, our focus is on artist books done in larger editions. For the most part, we don't carry artist books that are under, um, that are in editions of under 100. Um, um, and the prices of our books range anywhere from 50 cents or 25 cents up to in the thousands of dollars for books that have gone out of print. But a, a vast majority of our sale happens with books that are between the $5 and $50 range. Um, um, so, Okay, so now I'm going to continue with, um, as you can see, I don't have a written speech. Um, but I'm going to continue. How much time do I have left? Ten minutes. Ten minutes, perfect. Okay. Uh, Telford Stokes and Helen Douglas were, were really pioneering artists, artists, book, artist bookmakers who did an imprint called We Productions based in Scotland starting in the 70s. And they're not well established in the, in the kind of art world, but their work, I feel, is, is just shows an amazing skill and use of the totality of the book in... In, uh, in their artist book works. And this is a collaboration called Real Fiction. And as you can see, there's a self-referential with pages, reproductions of pages turning. But they also really uh, reference it as well to the architectural structure and space of the book, where you see that a doorway gets cut out of the page, and then later the page gets cut through with different references or reproductions of construct constructing and deconstructing architectural spaces. And uh, while they split their collaborative process, Helen Douglas went on to produce, uh, uh, goes on to produce uh, uh, many really extraordinary photo-based artist books. Um, this is a book by Chuck Close from the 1970s called Keith, and it's offset lithography, and it was done in an edition of about 5,000. And um, it's an accordion fold book that basically does different variations of a, po of, of a portrait and um, extends out into a, into a, um, into a accordion fold. And basically, it now sells for $40, but for most of its distribution life, it sold for its original uh, 1977 price when it was or 78 price when it was originally published of $6. So it really fulfilled its mission, even one by leading artists. I know that the Ed Boucher books now sell for thousands of, or hundreds and sometimes even thousands of dollars, but, um, but uh, it's, it's, it is a book that fulfilled its mission of, of broad circulation and, 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 and accessibility. Uh, play, paper Events by George Machunas, I'll just quickly show you, is one that really deploys, the, uh, 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 uses the, the space and the sculptural space of the book. This is a book, Printed Matter, published called Absence, uh, part of our publishing program by Mi Jin Yoon. Um, a Korean-American architect, and it's a tribute to the World Trade Center, where the World Trade Center exists inside of the space of the book. The book is 120 pages for the 120 floors of the building, and she did it as kind of a reflective, quiet, contem contemplative memorial that you could hold in his hands, ha one could hold in one's hands, as opposed to the multi-billion dollar, you know, other monuments that, that, um, that, are, that are not that accessible. Um, and when the book is closed, the buildings kind of come back intact. Athena Taka is a sculptor and 
conceptual artist um, who really has been overlooked, and she did extraordinary works, autobiographical studies, psychological portraits, and then these physiological kind of portraits and studies as well. Gorilla Girls Museum Activ Activity Book is a printed matter publication. The Gorilla Girls strike at the heart of the museums of, with uh, 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 you know, laying bare the underrepresentation, the gross underrepresentation un under of women and artists of color in museums and art institutions. And they make it fun with a, you know, connect the dots and interactive games and, and how to you know, make your own labels to infiltrate the museums. Sweaters that talk back, that, that looks kind of Norwegian actually. Um, anyway, Sweaters That Talk Back, Lisa Ann Auerbach, an LA-based artist who, um, who uh, uh, did political slogans around the time of Obama's elections into knitting form, and it has charts, so you can actually um, you know, make your sweaters out of it, which is a nice kind of extension. One of Printed Matters' most popular artist books, A Field Guide to Weeds, by Kim Beck, which um, is a book with the opposite of one that sells once every two or three years. This book by an artist who's relatively unknown. Kim teaches at Carnegie and, and, and exhibits her work, but she's not, you know, doesn't have big star status, and she sells thousands of them. And we sold them by the hundreds to department stores in, um, in Tokyo and other wholesale sellers. Um, some of the kind of new abstractionists, Sam Falls and Matt Connors. Josh Smith, uh, you know, sometimes figurative, sometimes uh, kind of new generation expressionist painter, who manic bookmaker and producer. Um, Tennessee Fish, where he reproduces a guidebook to the fish of Tennessee. Um, Hans Peter Feldman, voyeur, you know, preceding the picture generations, appropriations, of course, Hans Peter Felden was doing the same thing. Now, of course, with the even more greater proliferation of imagery via digital media, we have a whole new generation of artists doing appropriation found and otherwise, um, you know, retooled existing images. Um, using the, the, you know, the internet as a source. This is one of them, Sarah Swinar's book. Um, this is one of the more expensive books that we've carried. It's The Holy Bible, Old Testament by David Hammonds, and it, it's about this big, and it weighs about 20 pounds or about 10 kilograms, and it has golden gilded, golden gilded uh, edges. And when you open the cover, it's actually just a uh, the catalog resume, the complete works of Marcel Duchamp, and in this, you know, Hammonds kind of makes a wry comment on the kind of, um, you know, the, the canonization of the ultimate, you know, iconoclast, and in the way also kind of reflects on his own complicity in that, in that kind of system of hero worship. Um, this is one of my favorite artist books, and I think it speaks well to the dissemination of knowledge and how it's tied into market forces and how a big part of what we should do is, and what artist books are about or what other kinds of forms of media um, intervention are about is challenge that and find alternative routes. And it's by the artist uh, Eva Maria Marie Weinmeier, and the book is called Larry. And what you see is what Larry stands for, is Larry is the... Um, the back end of Rosamund Felsen Gallery, which is a very fine contemporary art establishment in Los Angeles, in the Santa Monica area of Los Angeles. And what the book was, it was simply a documentation of an exchange or a kind of event that, that Weinmeier um, um, staged. And what she did, this is pre-internet, so this is the days of faxes, but it's really kind of an intermedia piece. And what she did was she posed as a collector, and she approached the gallery that she was interested in buying a print by a print, no less, by, by Bruce Nauman. And uh, she said, I really can't decide between these two different prints. I think they're both very you know, compelling and interesting. Could you please fax me you know, them so I can try to decide what to, how to make my purchase for my good, nice contemporary art collection? And the gallery says, certainly, we'll fax them along to you. And so she sends over the faxes of the, of the two different prints. And then Eva Maria writes back to the, to the gallery and says, you know, as I was sitting there in my home, and I saw the fax coming through the fax machine, and I was thinking about how this artwork on the other side of the ocean, you know, was, you know, tr was, you know, reproduced and transmitted into electronic images and, you know, set or, or electronic signals and sent over phone lines and then reformulated as this print coming out of my fax machine. I thought, wow, this is actually a much, much more interesting piece. I, I would like to keep this as my Bruce Nauman instead. So how much do you want for it? And the gallery said, no, 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 you cannot consider this a Bruce Nauman piece by any means. You know, you, it's, it has no value whatsoever. And um, which piece do you want? And she wrote back and she said, 
well, actually, it really is much more interesting to me. I'm going to keep it as my Bruce Nauman piece, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to make an artist book out of this project, and I will give you half the edition in exchange. And that's what she did. She gave half the edition to the gallery. I have no idea what they did with it. And then she, gave the, she eventually distributed much of them through Printed Matter, the other half of the edition. Um, this is just quickly to wrap up. It's just I want to talk about, you know, there's a, there, the, 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 the growth of the New York Art Book Fair, we're really experiencing, even though the commercial industry is in a series of kind of prolonged, in a, in, in a prolonged you know, economic crisis, as not, not only due to the proliferation of digital media and the, the taking away of advertising dollars and stuff like that, but it also really is linked to the kind of monopolization of kind of corporate economies and things like that. When during the big economic crisis of 2008, you know, these big, the, most of the publishing is done by these mega media corporations and stuff, and many of them shed many of their subsidiary, com subsidiary publishing imprints that do a lot of the more interesting or challenging work, and it just is part of this homogenization of corporate culture that comes with kind of whatever global corporate capitalism and stuff. And in the meantime, at the level of artist books and self-publishing and in the fairs, we're seeing this amazing resurgence of artist book publishing. Um, and I guess, is it, am I done with my time? I can't see the signal. I still have five minutes. Okay, then I can keep going. Um, is, is we're really seeing a resurgence in this publishing, and I see it being in part a kind of a, a, a reaction against this kind of, you know, homogenization of monolithic cultures and that, and that young people are, are finding the value of, um, of, 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 uh, of the collaborative and, and also the tactile aspects of publishing. Now the new generation of publishers are by no means Luddite. They're not anti-technology. They are, they are using whatever technologies are available, but they're coming to the realization that, you know, the kind of virtual space and virtual uh, communities and virtual society does not displace or replace, you know, real physical ones. And I think the, uh, the opening remarks that brought up that referenced the Arab Spring and stuff like that is another kind of more politically high stakes uh, version of the same thing where the resistance to the regime to the you know to the to the Egyptian regime happened you know vi taking full advantage of the different electronic digital means available through social media and other things but ultimately it wouldn't have happened if there wasn't that physical community and there wasn't that physical con confrontation and the occupation of Tahrir Square and likewise I think that these the, the the current generation I don't know I guess some of you might be part of it um, who are raised really the first generation that became computer literate at the same time that they were acquiring language and have been raised for a large part on these kind of utopian technocratic myths of like how you know free um, information is going to equal free markets is going to equal free societies is going to equal free you know everyone's going to be free and there'll be no more wars well actually there's more wars than ever going on right now and there's gigantic displacements of populations and 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 and, and major you know world upheavals going on and so that myth has kind of been exploded and also of course you know the dark side of surveillance whether it's you know consumer surveillance or or corporate surveillance or state surveillance as in the US especially um, that this kind of you know technology is going to liberate us is is also not as also you know that myth is also falling apart as well um, so this is an example of swill children and they take their name swill children is taken from I believe it was a term that was used to describe kind of homeless children during the Industrial Revolution in England who kind of um, who kind of used the refuse of, of the streets and, and industry to somehow survive. It has something to do with that. And uh, in this they use Risograph, which is this Japanese office printing uh, developed in Japan, um, you know, printing uh, 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 office re reproduction technology, really. It was meant for off office reproduction because it can go extremely fast, but it also has these interesting print-like print -like qualities. And, and you can get the machines for relatively cheap. If you get them used, they break down all the time. But these young artists are learning to kind of retool the, uh, the machines, how to fix them themselves, and are getting together in collectives and collectively buying a risograph machine and then doing these, these large edition you know, artist books. Um, um, just a word about the economy is that 
when Printed Matter was founded, it was founded as a for-profit company, not because the founders thought that they would turn a profit, but they really did believe in this idea of an alternative independent economy of cultural production and distribution. And they quickly found it's just not true. It's like we, Printed Matter is still a nonprofit. It, uh, we still rely on, on funding for the publishing. Publishing is economically still a, a, a very, very challenging proposition, but um, I see with the, the new generation of publishers and stuff is they really are trying to figure out ways to make it economically viable and to make a truly independent kind of art production um, uh, model. Um, so that is Will Children, uh, David Horvitz. This is kind of a, a project that, that he did as a kind of in, uh, a Wikipedia intervention by posting different images of these different popular tourist sites on the west coasts. And, um, and it was thought of as some kind of hoax or something like that. Anyway, it was a use of both geographic space, uh, digital space, and then physical space. And so it's an interesting also kind of like artist book that relates to internet and other pro projects. Retard Riot, a uh, uh, kind of uh, new zine. And this is by an anarchist call, group called uh, 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 Research and Destroy New York City who have a publishing imprint. And they, um, they put out a, a steady both you know, how-to books about civil disobedience and protests, but also reproducing kind of classical anarchist texts and, and other philosophical tracks and stuff. And this is Printed Matters uh, publication, Queer Zines, which is based on an exhibition that we did, edited by A. a. Bronson, our former director, and Phil Ahrens, the chair of our board. And the zine culture, I mean, now zines are meant to mean anything that is photocopied and printed and kids are discovering, you know, um, you know, cut and paste aesthetics as if they goddamn invented it. It's been around for a long time. Um, zines to me meant punk rock and, 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 uh, and where everyone, their sister, uncle, brother, and dog made a zine as well as started their own band, as well as started their own record label, as well as booked their own tours. It was a DIY aesthetic. And, um, but the zines also really were alternative media. And so going back to the underground press of the 60s and 70s or even further back to political tracks um, of when printing technologies were reduced to uh, become affordable and portable and stuff like that. You can see a, a long historical trajectory to current zine making, but whether it's Tom Paine's Thomas Sense or the queer zine culture, it was uh, a space where people could represent themselves um, within the space of media. And whereas when, where, when they're either marginalized, neglected, or ignored, here they take control of their own media representations. And I think that that is one of the finally politically and culturally empowering thing about the possibilities of the artist's book. And now I'm done. I even got the title in. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>